As we always do, we'll begin with prayer, so please uh, rise. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. We give thanks unto you, O Lord God of our salvation, for you do all things which are for the welfare of our souls, that we may ever look upward to you, the Savior and benefactor of our souls. For you have refreshed us in that part of the night which is past, and have raised us up from our beds, and has led us to stand here in worship of your precious name. Wherefore we entreat you, O Lord, to give us grace and power, that we may be vouchsafed with understanding, to sing praise unto you and to pray without ceasing, in fear and trembling, working out our own salvation through the help of your Christ. Be mindful, O Lord, of those who cry aloud unto you in the night. Hearken unto them and have mercy, and crush under their feet invisible and warring enemies. For you are the King of peace and the Savior of our souls, and unto you we ascribe glory. To the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. My hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, my protection, the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place all my hope in you, Mother of God. Keep me under your protection. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome, everyone, for another round of our adult education program. Uh, this year, you know, in thinking about what uh, we were going to be studying, you know, we had done the, fir the first section we kind of covered was the liturgy. And then last year, we did the Feasts of Christ, the Feast of the Lord. And so this year, I was contemplating what kind of what we wanted to do. And I settled on uh, studying the sacraments. And the reason, uh, I'll tell you, uh, I'll tell you just in just a second, the reason why I decided on it. The reason I chose the sacraments be was because, uh, first of all, it kind of flows out of the liturgy to continue looking at the other sacraments of the church. Obviously, the liturgy kind of holds a, a, a central place in the life of our church as the sacrament, the receiving of the body and blood of Christ. Um, but it's also important to connect the liturgy to the other sacraments of the church and to see how they all work for our salvation. Also, uh, really, if we, if we think about the sacraments, and I'll touch on this today as well, uh, the, you know, the, we talked last year about the mystery of salvation and how Christ came down as a man, became a man to become one of us so that we could have eternal life in the kingdom of God. He opened that way. He opened the way for us to the kingdom. But he didn't leave us without the road back to the kingdom. So he didn't just come and go back and leave the door open and not showing us the way to get there. And the way that the, we get there through the life of the church is primarily through the sacraments, through the sacramental life of the Orthodox Church. So... That's why uh, I decided to, to choose the sacraments, and I hope that it will be a fruitful and blessed uh, topic for us this year, something that will be beneficial for us all. We have a couple of um, pictures here of different sacraments. We have a baptism and a wedding, which are, I think are the most, uh, some of the most recognizable. Next to that, we have the kind of the different things that are used in holy unction. And then on the far right, we have the uh, holy ordination, which is when a, a person becomes a, a clergyman. So we'll be studying and looking at different, uh, different sacraments and what they mean and the symbolism and the prayers that go along with them. So with that, we shall begin. The first place we're going to start today is going to be kind of a general introduction of the topic of sacraments. We're not going to look at any specific sacraments today. That will begin next month. But I think it's good to kind of look at uh, our theology on sacraments in general to kind of give us the groundwork as we move forward to what these different services and what these different things mean for us as Orthodox Christians. So the first question that makes sense to ask is, what is a sacrament? And the first quote that I'll have, and all the quotes on the, on the slideshow are on your uh, sheet as well. I uh, hope everybody got one um, to follow along with as well. So the first quote here is from Father Alexander Schmemann. He's actually a 20th century theologian. And he writes, through all these acts, meaning the sacraments, we are made participants 
and beneficiaries of the great mystery of salvation accomplished by Jesus Christ. And it kind of touches on what I had just mentioned a couple minutes ago about how the sacraments link us to, the, to Christ and his uh, uh, divine economy, so to speak, the plan of salvation. So the, the plan of salvation was accomplished many years ago, but how do, we, how do we participate in it? We participate in it by partaking of the sacraments of our church. This is what Father Alexander is writing here. So, what is a sacrament? How do we define it? Uh, a sacrament is when the love and the grace of God is made manifest to us through material signs. So, we are always surrounded by the grace of God and by the Holy Spirit, but there are times in our lives when God becomes very apparent through material things. So, for example, we have in holy baptism, uh, God sends down His Holy Spirit and sanctifies the water. And the water becomes the material sign of God's grace. This is a sacrament. In the wedding service, you have the crowns. And the crowns are blessed and placed on the bride and groom. And so these crowns become the symbol, the material sign of God's love and mercy and grace on the newlywed couple. We've talked about in the past, past sessions, Holy Communion. And how in Holy Communion, the bread and the wine become the body and blood of Christ. And so this bread and wine are the material, physical signs of God's love and mercy on us. The word sacrament is actually uh, the Latin word, uh, which we use in our, our vernacular as well. The Greek word is mysterion, or mysteries. And in, in Orthodox uh, theolo uh, theology, you'll hear that a lot, the mysteries, the holy mysteries of the church. And why do we call it a mystery? Because, as we've been saying, the sacraments communicate to us and connect us to the mystery of salvation accomplished in Christ. And they are, in a way, mysterious just in the way that God is able to transmit His love to us through these very basic things. Like how God is able to make a new life out of someone being baptized in water. Or how God is able to transform the, the bread and the wine into His own body and blood. These things are mysteries. We can't really grasp them in their fullness. We can understand what they are and what they mean for us, but you know, there is a, a, a level of mystery in how these things actually take place. And so in the Greek, we refer to them as mysteries. Um, in the Latin, it was the sacrament. Uh, both terms are fine. We'll use both interchangeably um, during these sessions. Now, why is it important to have the material sign? There are many Christian denominations that would reject this outright, that would say you don't need these material signs, that only prayer is important, or only these whatever, or whatever. I don't really know them, the, the other theologies of the other Christian denominations. But, you know, there are Christian denominations that do not have a, a liturgy, that do not offer Holy Communion. Many do, but many don't as well. Uh, so, why the material objects? Why does God use water and bread and holy oil and, uh, and crowns to show that He is active and present for us in our lives? First of all, we ourselves are physical beings. We are material beings. We cannot deny this, right? We have a spiritual side, of course, our souls, our, 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 our souls that are, are spiritual and non-physical, but we also have our bodies. So we're made up of a body and a soul. And so God wants to touch every part of our being, not simply the spiritual or the physical, but both. And he's able to do these in the sacraments by, us, by placing spiritual significance and spiritual uh, benefits in these physical objects. The second thing is that creation itself is good. There's nothing bad about God's creation. In, in the book of Genesis, we hear over time and time again, God created the light and the light was good. God created the... Uh, this, the moon and the stars, and it was good. And God created the, the animals and the fish of the sea, and it was good. Uh, and at the end, God said it was, and the, uh, the author Moses, he says it, it was very good. So we know that creation itself, there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing bad about it to say that oh, we should not use it in our worship services. Uh, God chooses, I have a typo there, God, cho God chooses to use this good creation of his for our benefit to show us His love in ways that we can comprehend and in ways that, again, touches us 
on a, uh, a physical level, because as I said, we are physical beings as well. Also, this makes us, this makes nature cooperate in our own salvation. So it's not even then the salvation of mankind, it's really the salvation of the whole universe. We do not reject the created world. We incorporate it into everything that we do so that the created world can also be sanctified. We are not so self-centered as to think that only mankind will be sanctified by God's love. Even nature itself now is being sanctified and brought into a state of holiness um, through the sacraments. And these material signs, they, they convey uh, specific gifts that God is offering us. For example, water is a symbol of cleansing. So in the baptismal service, which we'll talk about next month, the water that the person is baptized in cleanses them of sin, cleanses them of the old life that leads to death, and uh, brings about a new life in Christ. In Holy Communion, we have the bread and the wine. They're symbolic of our spiritual and physical sustenance, right? That without these things, we will starve. Without the bread and the wine of the Holy Communion, the body and blood of Christ, we will starve. And so just as we eat on a daily basis to survive, we cannot live without Holy Communion. We cannot live without that bread and that wine, which are the body and blood of Christ. Oil, even in the ancient world, was a, uh, a, a material that was used for healing. And then in the same way, in Holy Unction, it's a, it's a, it's a healing uh, sacrament as well. So these specific material things are not chosen randomly, but rather to show us exactly what God is offering to us through these sacraments. So it's kind of a, a little bit of a long quote here. Uh, it's in your, it's in your uh, packet. This is from St. John Chrysostom. He's talking about the baptism service. And he's talking here about how there's the spiritual reality and there's the physical reality, and they become one in the baptism. And he says, when you come to the sacred initiation, meaning baptism, because that is our initiation right to become a Christian, the eyes of the flesh see water. The eyes of the faith behold the Spirit, meaning the Holy Spirit. Those eyes, meaning the physical eyes, see the body being baptized. These see the old man being buried. By the old man, he means the life of sin that leads to death. That life is buried in the baptism service. The eyes of the flesh see the flesh being washed. The eyes of the spirit see the soul being cleansed. The eyes of the body see the body emerging from the water. The eyes of the flesh see the new man, uh, this should say the eyes of the spirit see the new man come forth brightly shining from that new purification. Our bodily eyes see the priests as from above. He lays his right hand on the head and touches him who is being baptized. Our spiritual eyes see the great high priest, Jesus, as he stretches forth his invisible hand to touch his head. For at that moment, the one who baptizes is not a man, but the only begotten Son of God. So everything that takes place in the sacraments, in other words, is not simply a, uh, uh, a physical act. There is a spiritual reality that is behind it as well. So I think St. John sums this up very beautifully, how there's more going on, I think, than we see. And this is part of the mystery as well. So one of the important things that we'll be discussing uh, throughout the year is that the sacraments help us and make us participate, uh, participants in the life of Christ. And we see the life of Christ coming through the sacraments. In other words, the, in the sacraments, Christ himself is reaching out to us in order to touch our lives. We just heard St. John, the uh, John Chrysostom talk about how it's not the priest who baptizes the new Christian, it's Christ himself who reaches out to touch the head of the new Christian and to baptize him. So in all of these sacraments, it is not simply the priest or the people, but it is Christ himself who is acting on our behalf. And we talked about this a lot with the liturgy as well. How in the liturgy, the priest is simply the hands and the voice of Christ, uh, who is the one who is actually performing the, 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 the mystery of transforming the bread and the wine. And we also experience the life of Christ through the sacraments. St. Leo the Great has a beautiful little quote here, and he says, He who was visible as our Redeemer has now passed into the sacraments. So at one time, Christ was a visible, you know, he lived on earth, he was a, he was a, a human being, he became like one of us and still is, but he's no longer visible to us. He ascended into heaven. He's not here anymore in that way. But he has passed into the sacraments. His, we experience him, in other words, in the sacraments of our church. We can still see Christ 
and touch Him and be touched by Him and even taste of His body and blood through the sacraments. So this is why we call the church itself the body of Christ. All of us together make up the body of Christ. And in this body, we experienced, uh, we experienced the life of Christ and are filled with His life uh, through the sacraments. Father Anthony Conyers here says, The sacraments are the ways by which we come into intimate, personal contact with Jesus today. The sacraments are like the hands of Jesus reaching out over the expanse of time to touch us with his love and power and let us know that he is still with us. And it's a very powerful thing for us to think about as Christians. That God, even though we live 2,000 years after he left this earth and ascended into heaven, that he is still reaching out to us to let us know that he is with us and that he wants to fill us with his love and his power. So one of the questions, it's like a Sunday school trivia gimme, right? Is how many sacraments are there in the Orthodox Church? So the basic answer that we usually give is seven. Yeah, that's the usual answer that we hear. And those seven main major sacraments are baptism, chrismation, holy communion, holy confession, holy unction, marriage, and holy ordination. Those are the seven. What you see here in the picture is holy unction. That's the, the baby being chrismated. Um, or no, this is the chrismation, excuse me. This is the baby being chrismated after the baptism. Uh, and these are the ones that we're going to focus on primarily in, this, uh, in these sessions. Uh, but... Uh, numbering the sacraments was never really a part of our tradition. Sorry, I know the text is a little bit small, but I'll, I'll kind of explain um, as, as what I have written down here. Numbering the sacraments, in other words, was never really a thing until, uh, I believe it was like the 13th, 14th, 15th century in the West. So really it's a function of um, the Catholic Church who decided that the number of the sacraments should match the number of the gifts of the Holy Spirit which St. Paul lists in his letters. So they list seven. And in our church, we have similar rites as the Catholic Church. And so we also, many people ascribe seven. But uh, there are actually other ones. <laughs> there are more than seven. Uh, so there are minor sacraments. The seven we talked about are kind of like the big ones, right? They're the really major ones. There's also other ones, though. And here's some other examples I have listed. For example, when a person decides to become a monk or a nun, the monastic tonsure is one of them. You have the great blessings of the water at Epiphany. You have the funeral service is a minor sacrament. You have the consecration of a church, which is a sacrament. You have the anointing or crowning of a king, which we don't really do anymore because we don't have kings. But in the old days, this would have been done in, through the life of the church. The king would have been anointed. You have something like preaching, which we don't really think about as a sacrament, but preaching can make present Christ. Preaching can bring people closer to Christ. And in that way, through the spoken word, which is that physical sign, the people are brought closer to Christ. Things like iconography, religious art, and music can be sacramental. Holy relics of saints, which are, again, physical signs of the grace of God. You have other blessings, such as the blessing of wine and bread, like the artoclasia. Again, minor, these are minor sacraments. But again, we have a physical sign that shows God's love. Also, the blessing of uh, fruit, homes, fields. There's blessing, prayer, uh, blessing prayers for uh, livestock, uh, especially for those who are farmers. There's, blessing prayers, uh, there's special blessing prayers for Pascha, for the eating of meats and cheeses after the fast. And all these things are sacramental in their own little way. The last one here I thought was very interesting, which was uh, charity. In other words, almsgiving. And there's a little quote here from St. John Chrysostom. It says, charity is a sacrament. For our sacraments, meaning the sacraments of the church we usually think about, are above all God's charity and love for mankind. So if in the sacraments God shows us charity, then when we go out and show charity to others, then we are bringing Christ to these people. St. John has another beautiful quote. I don't have it included here, but I just thought of it, where he talks about people who are coming to church and they pass by the poor on the way there who are on the doorsteps of the church and they do not offer anything to them. And he says, what do you think you will find in the chalice when you are walking past 
uh, the sacrament, basically, on your way to church. He goes, the, the body and blood of Christ is standing on the doorsteps of the church, and you walk right past it. And what do you think you'll find in the chalice? So we can't, um, we can't ignore these, these words and this, these powerful uh, ideas of St. John. Uh, so charity also can become a sacrament in that through the physical uh, sign of our, our gifts to those who are poor, we bring God's love and grace to those people and to ourselves as well. Even beyond that, so now, we're, now we've expanded from 7 to like 20 or whatever, or 17. I'm going to expand it even more. Sacraments beyond the church wall, church walls. For example, the church itself calls us to live our whole life as Christians sacramentally. Everything we do should connect us back to the grace, energy, and love of God. So it shouldn't just be, I come to church and I receive communion, and I receive God's grace and love, right? It should be that at every moment of the day, we are reaching out to God to receive His energy and grace and love. That as we offer our life to Him, that He will also offer these things to His life to us. And so, as Christians, we're called really to have our whole life be one sacrament of offering between God and mankind. Quote here from Father Thomas Hopko, who was a, a theologian uh, and, a, and the dean of St. Vladimir Seminary in New York, who passed away just a few years ago. But he's a beautiful uh, theologian. He writes, Traditionally, the Orthodox understand everything in the church to be sacramental. All of our life becomes a sacrament in Christ, who fills life itself with the Spirit of God. So if we're living our lives as Christians to the fullest, everything that we do, every moment of the day, every breath that we take, will be full of the Spirit of God. And that's how our life becomes a sacrament. Bishop Galistos Ware writes here, The whole Christian life must be seen as one great sacrament, whose different aspects are expressed in a great variety of acts, some performed but once in a person's life, others perhaps daily. So the point he's making here is some sacraments you only receive once, such as baptism, chrismation. Others happen every day. Having a meal with someone that you care about and love can be very sacramental, can make God present in your life and have experience God's love. That's something that can take place every day. So we shouldn't just think about the sacraments and limit them to the services, so to speak, that we have. Of course, those are very important, and that's what we'll be discussing. But we also have to have an understanding of sacrament as touching every part of our life, that everything that we do really should be offered to God in the, in the same way that we offer the bread and wine in, holy, in the liturgy, so that God can fill our life with His Holy Spirit and with His life. Even going beyond that, we can see that all of creation, the whole universe, can be a sacrament for us. For example, beauty in nature. So, growing up in Chicago, I didn't really know what nature was. Like, we have like forest preserves and we have uh, parks and the botanic gardens are nice and things like that. But until you really go somewhere that has a, a, a different level of natural beauty, you really don't understand it, right? So my president is from Utah. So now that I've been many times to Utah, uh, I've had the chance to experience it. And when you go up into the mountains and you're surrounded by these beautiful trees and streams and waterfalls and you look down over the valley, the one thing that strikes you most is how much God loves us, right? You see this beautiful creation and you say, look at how much God loves us. He created all of this. He did all of this for our sake, you know, so that we can grow closer to Him. And in that moment, when you're out in, in that beautiful natural space, God calls us, and He draws us closer to Him. And we are drawn closer to Him through that beauty. So this is an example of how the whole universe is God's sacrament. He's in, in everything, in every little corner of this created world, He's trying to bring us closer to Him. He's trying to help us to experience Him in our own lives. And this is the mystery of salvation through the sacraments. So now that we have an idea of kind of the broader sense of the word sacrament, uh, we'll, move, we'll move on here. Any questions so far before I continue? No? Okay, good. Now, one of the things as a priest I feel like is very important to talk about when we talk about the sacraments. So me now as sacraments, I'm kind of refocusing, zooming back in to the services of the church, is that they are not magical, they're not magic tricks, they're not like hocus-pocus stuff, right? So the sacraments are not magic. They're not, 
they're not simply ancient rituals that invoke or conjure up the power of God for our benefit, right? We don't have, that's like a, like a witchcraft view of our services. And I, I'm not saying this to say that you all believe that, but there are those who do. Like, the priest has to say these words in this order, otherwise the sacrament is not legitimate, right? Like, or if I come to Holy Unction, to receive Holy Unction, then I will be healed, which is not a bad thing to pray for, right? To pray for healing. But we also know that there are many people who receive holy unction who are not healed physically, who do not receive that healing, that, they're, that physical healing that they're looking for. This is also important to point out because through the history of our church, this has been a problem. For example, in the early church, the iconostasis was very short and the community was very close together. And so the people heard every word that the priest was saying. Some began to uh, memorize the liturgy and would simply do it at home on their own. They would, stand, they would go at home and they would have bread and wine and they would perform the liturgy at home by themselves. Because they had this idea that if they said the right words in the right order and did the right motions, that it would become the body and blood of Christ. So this is a false, this is a false mentality. Uh, and I would hope that it's something that we, we can avoid and that we've, we've grown past. But I, I think it's worth saying. Again, is every person who receives holy unction healed? Does every baptized Christian become a saint? The answer, of course, is no. Why? Because it's not a magic trick. The priest doesn't go uh, say the magic words and, and poof, like you're going to be a saint. That's not how it works. Uh, what the sacraments, rather, are meant to do is they're meant to give you a personal encounter with God. They're not meant to be, um, again, uh, the, the term I'll use again is they're not meant to be like some trick you know, of God where we conjure up His power and His grace for our benefit. They're meant to bring you close to Him so that you can meet Him and hopefully align your life with His so that He can fill it with yours. So, sacraments as personal encounter. And that's, this is how we should understand the sacraments, as a personal encounter with God. In the sacraments, Christ reaches out to touch our lives in different ways. Sometimes healing, sometimes blessing, sometimes forgiving, such as in confession. Sometimes empowering and uniting, etc., etc., etc. Father Anthony here writes again, Through the sacraments, God shares his life with us. He redeems us from sin and death and bestows on us the glory of immortality. The kingdom of God becomes accessible now in the sacraments, through which being in Christ and sharing in the life of God are realized. So the sacraments are a sharing in the life of God. Each encounter is made for us on a personal level. Personal level. So the sacraments are meant to be personal. Something that each affect each one of us on a personal level. And this is why, for example, when we have these sacraments, we always give our name. Right? When the person is baptized, it's the servant of God, John, is baptized in the name of the Father and the Son. It's not you know, uh, a nebulous thing. It's for this person. Same thing with chrismation, right? With Holy Communion, the servant of God, John, receives the body and blood of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. When a priest is ordained, they use his name, right? It's specific to a, a personal, on a personal level. Even things, again, like Holy Unction. When a person is anointed with Holy Unction, you use your name. Uh, one of the things that in my readings, uh, Father Alexander Schmemann points to is the prayers for preparation of Holy Communion. And he says in these prayers, we see that communion is a very personal thing. And I have an example here I'd like to read just briefly. So, in this prayer, it says, Mortify the soul-corrupting passions of my body. You who by, by your burial did lead captive the kingdom of Hades. So, Christ is buried for all of us. But now it is for the, the, the cleansing of the passions of my body. <clears throat> you who by your life-giving third-day resurrection did raise the forefathers who had fallen, raise me up who slip in sin, placing before me the ways of repentance. Christ is resurrected for the sake of all of us. But now in Holy Communion, I experience it on a personal level. You who by the descent of the comforting spirit did make your sacred disciples precious vessels, show me also to appear a vessel for his descent. So in the Holy Spirit, Christ fills his disciples and through them the whole world with the Holy Spirit. And now, as we take, partake of the sacraments, we ourselves become personal vessels of the Holy Spirit as well. Let's talk about that for a moment, vessels of grace. We talk about how the sacraments impact us differently, right? 
uh, and how the sacraments affect us and impact us is dependent on us and what we are able to receive. Think about someone going to a well or a spring of fresh water. They're only able to take with them as much water as fits in their water bottle or canteen or whatever they brought with them, right? If they bring a big, big old thing, they can take a lot of water with them. But if they only bring a little, like imagine the Ayesmo bottles we give out on Epiphany, you can only take that much with you. In the same way, when we come to receive the sacraments, we are filled with the amount of grace that our souls are able to receive. Our souls are that vessel of grace, of the Holy Spirit. And the more faith that we have, the more obedience and humility that we have to the life of God, the bigger our vessel becomes. And when we come to receive the sacraments, we are able to be filled more and more with God's grace. Father Anthony has a, a nice little uh, illustration here. He talks about a straw, like think of a drinking straw, that is placed in line with the current of the Gulf Stream, or like a powerful river. If you, if you hold a straw in the middle of a powerful river, all of the essential quality, he writes, all the power of that stream or that river will flow through it if it's in line. If it's lined up with the way the water's flowing, it'll go right through, right? It'll become a conduit, it'll become a stream of the river itself. It'll become part of the river. So it is with human life. If we place our life in the direction of God's will, if we line ourselves up, if we align ourselves with the life of God, then it's not unreasonable to expect that the very life of God, with its great healing power, will flow through our life, just like the great river flows through a straw. So if we line our souls up, if we line our life and our spiritual life up with the life of God, He will flow right through us and fill us with His healing and His life. So sacraments, uh, we're getting close to the end here. Sacraments transform human life from birth to death. So for example, we have baptism, which is our birth into the life of the church. Chrismation gives us the energy for the life after the baptism. Communion, as we talked about, is our spiritual sustenance. We have the marriage service, which is uh, love, which is obviously a very important thing in the human life, and also childbearing. We have holy confession, spiritual healing, holy unction, physical healing. And we also have like, services like the funeral service, which is when we die. So if every moment of our life, and, and even before the baptism service, there's prayers on the day a child is born, there's blessings on the eighth day, the fortieth day, there's all these blessings. So really, if, if we uh, avail ourselves to the life of the church and the sacraments, every day from the day that we are born to the day that we're buried can be touched by Christ. And that's a very powerful thing for us. Father Thomas Hopko again, Thus from birth to death, in good times and bad, in every aspect of worldly existence, real life, life as God has created and saved and sanctified it to be, is given to us in the church. So he's saying the true life, the full life, is given to us in the church, from our birth to our death. This is Christ's express purpose and wish, the very object of his coming to the world. And he quotes here the book of John, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. So in the sacraments, Christ is offering us his life to fill us and so that at the time of our death, we may still have life, and that life will be eternal. Are there any questions before we dismiss for this first session? Yes, we'll uh, You had an icon of Christ holding someone on his shoulder. What yes. Is, what icon is that? This is the icon of the Good Shepherd, but unlike what we typically see where he's holding the sheep around his neck, this is a, an icon where he's holding a man, because really he's the, the shepherd of the sheep, but we're the sheep. So uh, I use this to show that Christ is, is always in touch with us. And in our, throughout all of our, especially our difficult times, uh, he carries us and, and sends us his grace and his life. Uh, and I think that connects very intimately with the sacraments because this is the way that he sends these things to us. And so in the sacraments, Christ takes on that role again of this good shepherd who lays down his life for us, who takes care of us and offers us everything that we need. So this is the good shepherd. Any other um, questions? Yes, why, why is funeral not one of the main sacraments? Um, the, the question was, why is the funeral service not considered one of the seven sacraments? My guess is that, I, honestly, I, I can't tell you for sure. My guess, if I had to make an educated guess, would be that it's because it takes place when you're dead, to be honest with you. Um, what was that? There are seven. 
Well, this is not the seven, though. This is the, the seventh one would be ordination instead of funeral. Um, but it's considered one of the minor, minor sacraments. Um, so, it, like I said, honestly, that's, that would be my guess why it's not considered one of the, one of the seven major ones. Perhaps it's because the, the, when the list was originally compiled in the West, it was not considered one of the seven. I don't know. I'd have to do some more research. Maybe I can find out and, and let you know. Yes. I was told Father one time that um, the reason that funeral is not considered one of the seven major sacraments is because the seven major sacraments require us require a response mm -hmm. from us either through our like it, um, baptism for God here in the sacrament. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. When we come to the marriage sacrament, we're offering our love, mm -hmm. you know, and so in death when you're when you're dead, there's no response. No response. You cannot be responding. All right. And that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, I had, like, I, I've never heard that, but that makes, that makes a ton of sense. And I'll try to see if I can find out more uh, on that top point as well. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? So next month, we'll start with uh, baptism, and we'll start making our way. We're not going to talk about Holy Communion, because we we've done 10 lectures on it already, so we're going we're gonna to forego that one. But the rest of them will be discussed, and some of the minor ones as well. So, All right, thank you, God bless, and uh, have a wonderful week. <laughs> Και προστασίες θα μετάθε τον ελπίδαν Τάφος και νεκρώσεις φουλ και κράτησεν Ως γαρ ζωής μητέρα προς την ζωήν μετέστησεν O mitrani kisas, ai parthenos.